meaning beyond themselves in stories about the gods and the beyond. Yet today, contemporary culture and thought has left many alone with only human and contradictory perspectives on the universe. In the absence of something beyond ourselves, some would argue we have also lost meaning and purpose. Do we need the transcendental to give our lives meaning? Can we conjure a 21st century form of the transcendental in the philosophical mysteries of life and the universe? Or should we ring out a Nietzschean chair at the death of God and focus our attention on creating our own human meanings that have lasting value and importance? Welcome to this morning's event, um, and let me introduce our speakers. Rupert Sheldrake is a biologist, author, and parapsychology researcher, best known for his hypothesis of morphic resonance. Rupert has sole authored nine books, his most recent being Ways to Go Beyond and Why They Work. Maria Belasca is a philosopher at the University of Hertfordshire and author of the book Wittgenstein and Lacan at the Limit, Meaning and Astonishment. And last but not least, James Tartaglia is a British philosopher and author of the book Philosophy in a Meaningless Life. His main interest is in understanding and enhancing awareness of the nature of philosophical inquiry. So we will start with opening pitches from our three speakers in response to the question, do we need the transcendental to give our lives meaning? Rupert. Well, a lot of people don't have a sense of the transcendental. Most people in Britain describe themselves as non-religious. And uh, many have been brought up with a secular and materialist worldview, which tells us that the universe is made of unconscious matter, evolution is purposeless, the mind is nothing but the brain, or the activity of the brain, and it all goes blank when you die. Now, lots of people find that reasonably okay and lead satisfactory lives. Um, however, I think one of the consequences of this is a proneness to depression, and I think most modern secular societies are blighted by sort of huge levels of depression and people on antidepressants. If you look at the Middle Ages, when there was a shared view and a shared belief in transcendence, they produced, with a tiny population here in Britain, the great cathedrals like Canterbury and Lincoln and Wells and so on. Uh, there was a shared meaning uh, and a shared creation of great buildings. Well, of course, we have great buildings too, mainly banks. Um, so I think the first point is some people it's perfectly fine the way it is. However, if one looks at the actual things that change people's lives, looking at the natural history of life-changing events. A study started over 50 years ago by Sir Alistair Hardy at Oxford. It turns out that what people find really meaningful are things like near-death experiences, spontaneous mystical experiences, um, spiritual practices, and today increasingly psychedelic experiences. Also, there are many spiritual practices which can make it easier for these spiritual experiences to happen, these experiences of connectedness. Um, I've written about them in my recent books, things like meditation, prayer, rituals, connecting with nature, um, and indeed sport, which is one of the ways in which people in the modern world achieve altered states of consciousness. Um, meditation is all about coming into the present, because you can only have that experience of presence of the a greater consciousness in the present. Um, and it works reasonably well. I meditate myself. But sports uh, bring people into the present instantly. As a friend of mine said, he tried meditating when he was very, very busy and his mind was racing. It didn't work for him. He's a rock climber, though, and he said by the time he was 50 feet up a rock face, he was totally in the present. Someone skiing downhill at 60 miles an hour is totally in the present. Someone in the middle of a football match is totally in the present. So I think, actually, um, there are many hidden forms of connection with the spiritual realm and the sense of a greater presence in the modern world, despite the secular facade. So I think we do need this if we want to have a deeper sense of meaning. And I think even in a secular world where uh, religion has much less role to play for most people, uh, the need for these experiences generates a quest for them, and people find them in all sorts of different ways. Thanks, Rupert. Over to you, Maria. Do we need the transcendental to give our lives meaning? 
I think I need to draw a distinction between the transcendent and the transcendental to answer the question. So in ordinary language, we use the word transcendent and the word transcendental as synonymous, but in philosophy, they're not. So the transcendent refers to a reality that transcends our own reality, that extends beyond our own reality. The usual candidate for that would be God. But the transcendental doesn't need to refer to something otherworldly like God, to something that transcends the reality, but it can just refer to our own concepts and categories insofar as they are um, important for uh, sense-making itself. Let me give an example to explain. So we have concepts that describe things that we find in the world, like, for example, the concept of a lemon or a glass or a table. But then we've got concepts that do not describe things in the world, yet they describe things that are necessary for us to make sense of the world, like the concept of good or beautiful or concepts in mathematics or in logic, or the concept of a world itself or life, if by that we mean life as a whole. We don't find this um, whole anywhere in uh, the world. So if that's what we mean by the transcendental, then I think that the question of the meaning of life cannot but be situated within the transcendental. If by transcendental we mean the transcendent, I think it can, but it doesn't have to. Thanks, Maria. And finally, James? Well, I don't think we need to give our lives meaning at all because they're already packed full of the stuff. There's football meaning, office work meaning, festival meaning, restaurant meaning. Humans create meaning by taking on projects. We want to do something, we make that our goal, that becomes our purpose. As we pursue that goal, things take on a meaning in relation to it. You know, that helps me, that's an opportunity, that's an obstacle, that's a disaster. And we change this as, as we go through our lives, right? We're always adjusting our goals. Sometimes we've got lots on at the same time. So the idea of picking out one meaning as, you know, the meaning of a person's life strikes me as hopeless. Uh, I mean, here's an example, right? So if we were to think about um, some great artist who lived hundreds of years ago, we'd naturally say, well, the meaning of his life was provided by the art, the great art he produced. And thereby we maybe miss out this guy's happy family life. You know, think how much meaning that can involve. Or uh, maybe his last 10 years, which he spent in poverty. So as far as individual lives are concerned, I think that idea of meaning is just entirely interest relative and that's why people talk across purposes in these debates. If you're talking about the human race, I don't think there's any master plan that we're trying to fulfill. I don't think that there's anything that humanity is supposed to be doing. Um, I don't, you know, see any problem with that whatsoever. Uh, of course, many people in the world do think that there is some master plan that we're all following. Most people in the world are religious. But I would say this, if there is such a grand evaluative context for our lives, a meaning of life, then it could be either good or bad, right? It could be horrible. You know, nobody's ever been able to give any remotely plausible idea of what this meaning would be. So there's no reason to think it would be good rather than bad. If nihilism is true, on the other hand, okay, it can't be either good or bad. It's just a fact about our reality because it denies this notion of meaning as an evaluation. Now, the notion of nihilism was first introduced in the 1790s alongside the notion of the meaning of life. They came together, the good and the bad guy. And nihilism's got very bad press ever since then. But it seems to me that if you don't really believe in judging a person's whole life, which, you know, I wouldn't like somebody to judge my life, right? Okay, if you, don't, if you think that's baseless and probably quite a harmful practice, and if you don't think there's any grand master plan that's drawing us forward, then I would recommend to you nihilism and the correct understanding. Thanks, James. I want to push you a bit harder on that in relation to our first theme, which is... To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.